You may need your toothbrush at later parts of this talk as I attempt to untube AI in assessment. I'm hoping to provide a brief primer that's going to trigger some interesting conversations about the latest big thing in education. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Brown, and um, perhaps a little bit of background. I'm originally from New Zealand. I've been in Ireland at Dublin City University for around a decade. I came to establish the National Institute for Digital Learning, which, as you can see, is about to be rebranded as the National Observatory for Digital Education, NODE, which is quite apt for the type of work we do. I've given you a little task to think about um, over my talk with two truths and a lie. Hopefully the lie will be fairly evident to you um, by the time I get to the end. But without further ado, um, in preparing for this talk, I was thinking about what metaphor I might be able to anchor the talk around, hence the toothbrush, as I'll come to shortly. In the past, new technology in education has been linked to various metaphors. Um, the MOOC movement was talked about like an avalanche that was going to sweep changes throughout education. Educational technology is a bit like running to catch a fast moving train or building a plane on the fly. Any of these metaphors might have been appropriate or suitable. The roller coaster ride for AI for this talk, but actually um, I want to choose a different metaphor as you will see. And what triggered me to this line of thinking was this publication just out a few months ago actually has already looked at some of the metaphors that are being used to describe AI and education. As the image that I'm sure many of you have seen previously from over 100 years ago shows, new technologies in education as a way of automating learning is not a new idea at all for better and worse. And for better and worse, my metaphor that I've chosen is that I think AI is out of the tube. I'll leave you to decide whether I've made a convincing case. But for me, it's ubiquitous. We don't have much choice. It's impossible to put AI back into the educational tube or the assessment tube more specifically. I want to cover three things with you very briefly extending the sort of toothpaste metaphor, a quick health warning, some of which will not be that new to you. The bulk of what I want to talk about is learning the art of brushing both ways to extend the metaphor. And lastly, some very quick thoughts around developing positive habits for healthy minds or should that be healthy gums. I want to broaden the conversation around what we need to do as a profession. So that's the general roadmap. I have three messages that I want to make really explicit at the start. The first is I'm seeing a lot of AI-centric thinking right now. It is evident even in the way people choose titles, um, which comes first, the AI or assessment. Um, linked to that, I think we're overreacting um, in the strong focus on academic integrity at the expense of other areas that we should be talking about. Secondly, um, and that probably was a sub point, but secondly, it's clear that educators need to own shape and influence the narrative regarding assessment challenges that AI is attempting to solve. Putting it another way, um, who's currently getting to develop the solutions and define the problems in which AI solutions are attempting to solve. It's not the educators. And I say that conclusively based on a literature review from 2019 that identified the missing voice of educators in AI and education. Lastly, and I hope it's not too controversial for me to say, let's not forget that all was not well with assessment way before the emergence of chat GDB3. Um, or generative artificial intelligence more broadly. Uh, that last point about all not being well, um, 
triggered me in preparing for this talk to a really seminal text that I recall from David Perkins. You probably, um, those of you who are old enough will recall from training memories to educating minds. Um, the lack of relevance of a lot of assessment, the lack of challenge, the need to, of course, speaking of Perkins, um, promote transfer. Transfer is still not necessarily something we give enough consideration to. I mentioned about academic integrity before a little critically. That's because issues around academic integrity are not new. Um, we've developed this culture of banking in some of our school settings around assessment, learners banking their assessments, um, building up their credits, their marks, um, a bit of playing the game. Actually, let me just share with you for the first time publicly, I remember that I played the game when I was in my latter years of secondary school for three years running at the end examination in English. I reused the same essay. I'd memorized it. All I needed to do was put a different introduction and conclusion so that it fitted the topics that were available to me. Now, my rationale was because I was a very slow writer by hand and it freed me up with time. I guess you could say there was an academic integrity issue there. Was I cheating or just being smart? I'll let you decide. Okay, let's get started. A few health warnings. Well, most of this will not be new to you, I hope. And I won't go through everything in any great detail here for that very reason. But first, um, it's important to recognize that the tools that are available are largely subscription-based. They're not free, as we might be led to believe, or open, as we've been led to believe. It's really important that we don't treat ChatGDP3 and equivalent Gen AI tools as if they're this kind of big database that drawn from questions can be answered. It's much more powerful and adaptive than that. Of course, it's hard to explain because actually most of us don't truthfully understand how it works. And that's partly because those developing the tools and the platforms are not sharing their secrets. But what I can say is, my goodness, it's hard to keep up with what's going on. If you're struggling, don't worry, you're not alone. It is almost impossible to stay on top of not only the literature, but the developments in the area. Of course, we all need to be concerned about the serious biases, the discrimination, privacy issues, ethical issues, the propagation of inequity, marginalization of voices, and so forth. Just to amplify those points that um, you know, may not be aware, that over 90% already, this is before um, AI or chat GDP3 in particular, 90% plus of the open educational resources available on the internet were in English. Currently, in terms of Gen AI, only 10 languages are being reflected in the types of solutions that have been developed out of more than 7,000 languages. That's scary. It is important to recognize, despite what you might be reading or your initial experiences, that the latest Gen AI tools, Gen AI, Gen AI tools, actually are not as prone to fake knowledge as we may have led. They certainly can't make moral judgments, but they are much more accurate and are not generating um, references that are made up in the way they were or was in early times. Um, I probably won't mention anything else other than the last point because I'm going to talk about authentic assessment later on. But the last point around the fact that AI is not good for the environment, cloud computing is not good for the environment. This is a ticking issue that is only recently starting to gain some attention. So that's just to set the scene. This is really the bulk of what I want to share with you, the art of brushing both ways. It's another metaphor, extending the toothbrush metaphor, in part because my own institution has decided that it's given um, academic staff, teachers and those who support teaching, the option of designing in or designing out, designing assessments that recognize and provide opportunities for students to use generative artificial intelligence, or 
where students are told in the design out option that thou shall not be used. It's an interesting dichotomy, and it's one that I think is quite problematic given my toothbrush metaphor underlying the talk, but even more so problematic as recently as today, Wednesday the 20th of September, when I'm preparing this video, because the Minister of Education has the headlines in the Irish newspapers in making a decision largely, as you can see, because of fears of AI, to roll back what was previously planned to give teachers the opportunity to introduce some of their own assessments as part of the national leaving certificate um, in the high school senior secondary system. So this is really interesting to see how AI is being used already to return and to protect the integrity and in inverted commas there of traditional forms of assessment. Actually, even more broadly, we're seeing a response and there has been a long history of this, even educational television or the introduction of television as a technology resulted in this kind of moral panic. The Netherlands has already made the decision to ban phones and smartwatches from schools next year. Ireland is having those conversations. And I know that New Zealand is also having those conversations. So we really risk this kind of short-termism, uh, short-term thinking, evidence currently, I think, of some knee-jerk reactions. Some of it's triggered from a recent UNESCO report that's been wrongly interpreted, I should add, but that's for another day. I've been talking for a good probably 10 minutes at the stage, so let me just pause for a minute, gather my own thoughts, and give you an opportunity to participate in the straw poll. The QR code's there, the code is on the screen if you want to go to Mentimeter, um, but should we really be trying to defend our existing assessment practices? Is it really possible to avoid a spillage across design in and design out approaches? And thinking almost around the politics of assessment and the example I've shared with you in Ireland, do we risk a potential loss of confidence nationally, but probably locally and institutionally, if we don't adopt appropriate responses to AI. I'll let you decide what appropriate means. I suspect that will be the discussion um, over a number of months ahead of what really is an appropriate response. Okay, what I want to do now is pivot to a design in. I'm an optimist by nature, and as the toothbrush, as toothpaste metaphor suggests, I really just don't think at a pragmatic level the design out is feasible. What this publication produced late last year, um, a very good read does in a couple of ways. First, I think it shows us with the raft of tools that are introduced, that AI is pervasive throughout um, education. The second aspect to why I like this article is it shifts it away from that technocentric focus. I was talking about AI-centric focus because it's talking about the student-focused tools, the teacher-focused tools, the institutional-focused tools. So it's coming very much from an educational perspective rather than a solution perspective. Um, so I recommend it to you. I don't have time to go through all of the various tools that would be getting into the forest of AI, but it's true and fair to say that AI can be used right across our education sector and generative AI is only one subset of the implications that AI have for assessment. Perhaps what I will say is around the teacher-focused and institutional-focused aspects, the opportunities to automate, automatize or automate some of those administrative processes, those burdensome administrative processes might be where AI has really good opportunities to lead to efficiencies and effectiveness. I'll comment a little bit more shortly, but um, what I would also like to say is that focus on education is reflected in this publication as well, which again stands out because rather than coming at AI, what it does is look at assessment first and foremost, and it asks, what are the assessment problems we face? Um, some good Australian colleagues, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, 
but going from onerous to more feasible assessment, from discrete to continuous assessment, uniform to adaptive, inauthentic to authentic. I did point out earlier in that slide around the health warning, don't assume that authentic assessment is future-proof from AI, though. And then for more um, old, antiquated sorts of approaches to modernize assessment and that automation that I was mentioned in terms of administrative processes might be one aspect. So a good read in terms of anchoring and probably the detail of the paper is less important than the focus it shifts to what are the problems we actually face. And this article, uh, this um, slide shows one of the ones that most of us experience in our work. It comes from a US context around AI and the future of teaching and learning from the Office of Educational Technology federally but it just identifies that I've never come across a teacher that doesn't work long hours. So how might AI reduce some of the aspects of teaching that can create more time for teaching, learning, and assessment rather than the administrative planning um, side of things? As Henderson asks, what labor is uh, involved that could be offloaded or co-constructed with AI that might lead to those sorts of uh, efficiencies in the context of assessment. Actually, the Henderson I just cited, Michael Henderson, I'm sure many of you will know from Monash in, in Australia. This is probably my favorite quote when it comes to AI in the context of assessment. If our educators' evaluative experience through the application of the assessment criteria and standards cannot diminish between raw AI outputs compared with what students bring to the class with or without those from AI, then we have a problem with our assessment designs, not with AI, not with AI. I read that quite intentionally because there's a lot in it, but Michael, in a rather provocative way, puts it like this. Why should we assess something that AI can do better or just as well or better? It's provocative. It needs a little thinking. Um, didn't quite get the quote right there, but I hope that has um, got you thinking and is a good question for us to discuss. Moving on from that and what Michael's focus is really on about the design of assessment for an AI world, far from being the comprehensive list of what we should be doing. Just to start that conversation, I do think we need to revisit what we're trying to assess and why. Uh, emphasizing the process, perhaps more so than the product. One could argue they're one and the two actually are part of it, but certainly the product alone is a poor proxy for learning. Here's what I think is the critical part, finding ways of assessing the uniqueness of human processing, what it means to be a human, the, the creative, the empathetic, and so on, that maybe AI can't do. Empowering learners themselves to own the assessment process. This is not entirely a new focus. Um, and then focusing more on the creative assessment designs that elicit evidence of learning that really matters for a life worth living. That last part comes from a takeaway where UNESCO recently had their Digital Learning Week in Paris, uh, a strong focus on AI and education. And within that broader societal context, coming from a human-centric perspective, some of the challenges of AI on our lives the focus on education and preparing people for a life worth living. That's where that comes from. But that creative aspect that I was talking about is already underway. Here's a great uh, freely available text, 101 Creative Ideas to Use AI in Education. I won't go into the detail of them, but it would be certainly possible for the text to be mapped to assessment for learning, of learning, as learning, um, drawing on many very creative examples of how the out of the toothpaste AI can really be used to enhance the student experience and to enhance outputs for learners or opportunities for learners. 
Speaking of learners, I talked a lot about automating the administrative aspect, but actually for learners, and I mean include teachers when I refer to learners, actually I really would rather see us focus on augmenting learning rather than automating it. So here are just some examples. Um, obviously the engineer prompting that we have to do with tools like chat, GPT, um, are listed there from a UNESCO publication, but learning to ask the right questions, learning to make good use of a devil's advocate, a kind of mentor that we could use, a digital mentor, learning to make ultimately judgments about what counts as quality. Um, and despite my personal school experience that I shared earlier, learning that effortlessness is not always the goal to strive for, and that finding the light through the gaps or the cracks is really a sign of a well-educated person. Certainly a philosophy that I've brought to my work as an academic over many years. Lastly, I'm not sure how we're getting on on time, so I'll do this very quickly. I won't bore you too much or extend this metaphor too much further. Um, I've actually just taken five principles that were developed by um, the University of Technology in Sydney in a higher educational context. But I think these principles are quite strongly um, useful for uh, not only other educational contexts, but also where it says students, where I've been talking about learners, that could be replaced with teachers. It could be replaced with parents and caregivers and other community stakeholders that they need to understand the significance of AI more broadly in society, legitimate uses, equipped on how to engage critically and ethically, that um, understand the strengths and, and limitations as an aid to learning, and students need to be assessed on what they need to know in an AI world, just as teachers do also need to be prepared in a similar way. Um, drilling down a little bit further, you may not be uh, familiar with this publication that came out late last year from the European Commission producing a set of ethical guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence. And as part of the ethical guidelines that my colleague, Professor Deidre Butler, contributed to, there are a set of emerging competencies around AI, one of which relates to assessment, as you can see. But since then, of course, a lot has changed. Uh, and just recently, uh, in August, uh, this publication, which building on the TPAC framework, which is well established, certainly around the use of new digital technologies and teaching and learning, incorporating the implications of generative AI and colleagues from our partner university, Arizona State, um, leading that work. And then um, at the same event I've referred to in Paris, they launched this um, draft AI competency framework for teachers and students. The framework is currently out for consultation. So the URL there, which we will share with you more widely, you may wish to provide feedback on that framework. Quite clearly, um, in terms of wrapping this up, um, work needs to be done on shaping regulations and policies. This is not the Wild West of AI, which can't be left to be. We do need to critically review current assessment practices. Actually, I think that doesn't go far enough. Assessment practices are a reflection of the learning outcomes that we develop. And ultimately, I think we need to look at what learning outcomes we're um, posing and whether they are still appropriate before we talk about how we assess them actively engaging in communities of practice. And clearly this community is going to have a very important role going forward. And it's great that this conversation is taking place. Clearly supporting teachers, professional learning and development is crucial. How we do that without overwhelming them and adding to their already busy workload, I'm not sure. That's something we need to talk about. But I don't think because the toothpaste is out of the tube, we have any alternative but to start developing and implementing and researching, importantly, pilot initiatives right throughout education um, for learners at the teacher level and the institutional level. So some quick final remarks. I'm sure I'm actually over time. Um, first and foremost, 
what I see stepping back is at the moment there is a lot about how assessment is in change, that how AI is a change force and that we need to respond as educators in changing our assessment. What I see much less in the discourse and the, the conversations is about assessment for change. Ultimately, what is the change that we are seeking that AI might help to augment and provide through its affordances the opportunities for us to achieve? That's a shift in the narrative that I certainly think needs to take place. But these are entangled narratives, um, as evidenced by the ministers, the Irish ministers' announcement, as I shared earlier. Um, and if we really step back here, what's at stake? If you remember, I said in my subtitle that this is for future's sake. You see, I think that debates about AI and assessment really need to be anchored in broader social imaginaries. It's one of the ways and why I was thinking and drawn towards a metaphor. Our ideas about assessment need to be shaped by our ideas ultimately about what constitutes a good learner, a good citizen, and a good, hopefully, fair, equitable, and inclusive society. That's where we should be placing our debate, a discussion in that broader, bigger picture context. Having wrapped up, I did think it was just useful and intellectually honest for me to A, say that I had not used chat GDB uh, in preparing this talk, but I did think it would be interesting to ask what it might come up with if I were to use the metaphor of toothpaste being out of the tube in preparing something around the impact that generative artificial intelligence will have on the current and future assessment and feedback practices, you will see that there's quite a detailed and quite a substantive response. And it triggered me to a use of the metaphor that I hadn't thought of. You see, its response, if you're reading as I'm talking, is rather than AI coming out of the tube, it was talking about assessment coming out of the tube, our traditional approaches to assessment needing to be untuned. So an interesting twist. I'm sure there are other ways you can think about extending or not metaphors, um, the one I've chosen for this talk, uh, but I better stop where I'm ahead. So thank you very much. The last thing I have to do is just share with you the lie that truthfully, I've not taught in the schooling sector for over 25 years. Um, I don't profess to have a strong track record in um, uh, research on, sorry, the lie, I've got that wrong. The truth is that I haven't taught. The lie is that I don't um, profess to having a, a strong track record on assessment, um, although I was centrally involved in the Mahara e-portfolio um, and e-portfolios might be something that come really back in the vogue with the advent of AI. Um, I've also had publications around an interest in program-wide assessment, but I certainly don't consider myself to be firmly anchored in the assessment literature. If you saw that come through, then um, that's the reason. So thank you very much. Sorry about mixing up the, the truths and the lies. Our lives are complicated already. So hopefully I've triggered a few conversations that will follow um, over the next few weeks and beyond. Cheers. Thank you.